It's good to see y'all under the bright lights. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I'm never complaining about the bright lights. It, it really is good to be here. The other day we were, Charlotte and I were praying in the middle of the prayer. I was thanking God for something. And in the middle of thanking God for something, I started laughing because I really wasn't thankful. Um, has, has that ever happened? Uh, so I had to apologize after the prayer to God and to Charlotte, I think. So, but I am glad to be here today for sure and for certain. And Ephesians chapter two, verses one through nine are nine verses about grace. It's just a, a, a beautiful passage. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure I remember Chuck Swindoll saying something about grace and the danger of preaching on grace because people will take advantage of it. I looked for the quote, couldn't find it. So I still believe it's to be true. It's a dangerous thing to talk about grace because people will uh, take it for granted, take advantage. But in this passage about grace, we have three things that we're going to be uh, looking at today. One is why we need it. And uh, that's my part. And why it's the only thing that'll work. And also how we come to receive it. I mean, why we need it, um, and that's verses one through three, and you wouldn't think grace is there, but it needs, those three verses need to be there, because without them, we don't know where we were and why we need it. Verses one through three give us that. Um, at this service, we have what I would call uh, the before picture, all right? Now, can you imagine that in your mind for a minute? The, the before picture is never good, right? The after picture is what you want. Not the before picture. You're getting the before picture today. Um, let me give you a brief runway of, of chapter one. And you need to do a runway, isn't that right? Chapter one, as, as more than one of those who spoke uh, on this chapter have said, it's a beautiful chapter. It's unlike any in scripture. Um, Paul just seems to to stack word upon word and phrase upon phrase of who we are and what we have in Christ. Blessed, chosen, redeemed, adopted, forgiven, sealed with the Holy Spirit. And then he launches into what I would call a next level prayer. And when I say a next level prayer, when you hear that prayer, you're thinking, wow, you know? It's like you're thinking there's something he's asking for that I don't even know what it is. But he is, it is a definitely a next level prayer. My suggestion is every once in a while, get out your Bible and just read that one out loud and imagine him praying for you because that's what he's doing. <laughs> Chapter two, first thing we get is whiplash. And that's the truth. <laughs> what? It was so beautiful and now we're dead. Okay, that's how it goes. Um, we're going to get, we're going to look at three things this morning, more than three, but three primarily. Uh, first of all, we need to realize, we need to see Paul is going to show us that there is another power at work in this world. And we get a glimpse of that power. Second, um, Paul is describing us in the past tense. Verses one, two, and three is past tense. It is BC. It is before Christ. It is before we were saved. It is outside of Christ. It's our distant past for many of us. Um, he says once, wait a minute, hang on a second here. Uh, there you go. I was told to, look, to refer to this side because that's what comes across for those that, on the internet. For those who are on the internet, are you seeing this? All right. Um, <laughs> Sorry, he, he, uh, he says, in which you once walked. Uh, there are other uh, words that are used here, previously, formerly. Uh, this is something about our past, which is actually quite encouraging, by the way. Um, there's a lot to be said about the point where we move from B.C. to A.C., before Christ to after Christ. Uh, but Paul doesn't get into that. In this particular passage, He's got a main point he wants to say, and this is the way we were then, and this is who we are now. More details elsewhere. Um, but this is the second thing we need to see. And the third is Paul is not doing a, a, remember, a remember when. 
He's not talking, he's not bringing back any memories of our life before Christ. There's no reason to bring back memories of our life before Christ. Now, for many of you, and myself as well, it's been too long anyway because they're gone. All right? I don't remember much at all about when, before I was 15 years old, and there was really nothing to remember anyway. For some, you may have come to know Christ later on in life, and you've got history, B.C. Uh, some of us just don't. But it doesn't matter, as we're going to see here. He's not doing a remember when, but he's doing a, an understanding of what. He's not bringing to our remembrance, but he's explaining what took place, who we were, where we were. There are two words that Charlotte gave me this week that describes what he's talking about, condition and position. That's what he's describing. If you're a note taker, that's a good one, condition and position. And I'm pretty sure she got it from somebody else. Isn't that right? But we can't remember who it was. So what I'd like to do as we begin looking at this verse is I want to hover over it a little bit and get an aerial view. My background is in design. I used to draw houses, uh, get me through school, that kind of a thing, you know? So I need to see an overall picture first, and then I begin to work on the details. We're seeing the floor plan first, and then we'll look at the more details, all right? So I want to begin uh, with verse one, and he says, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins, in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Now, I, we need to pause there because the text kind of says so. Look again at it. I, 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 I love to outline. I love to organize. I want to put things in neat little boxes so I can get a hold of them. This passage works so well. And you were dead in not trespasses and sin, but the trespasses and sins. Yeah, that makes a difference in which you once walked. That's us. Then he goes on, following the course of this world, following, wait a minute, he's repeating himself. Following, following. You know what those are? 2,000 year old bullet points. Am I right? Do you see it? You were dead in the trespasses and sin in which you walked. And then he describes the walk. He describes the walk as following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. Following the course of this world. That's not really that hard to understand. You know, doing it like everybody else is doing it. And it, it, it starts when we're young. You know, you go, to, you go to any school and you see every kid is dressed the same. Isn't that right? And my mother used to say, I, mean, I, was, I would say things like, well, so-and-so was doing it. And she would say, and I don't mean it's disrespectful. If everybody was wearing a bucket of cow manure over the head, would you want one? And I look around and it's true. Yeah, I mean, do, but it's true. We're following the world. The second one, he says, the second bullet, all right, following the prince of the power of the air. It doesn't take us long to understand who that is, Right? Now, he's describing Satan. First of all, he's describing Satan with power in the air. Well, I'm not in the air. I don't think he's talking about floating. I'm talking about not being able to see him. You don't see him. He's there, and his power is there. And we know that. But he's saying that's where we were, following the ways of the world, following the powers, following, excuse me, following the prince of the power of the air. And he gives us a little more detail on that one. Um, the prince of the power of the air, which is the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Now, the phrase that popped out for me is the sons of disobedience. Sounds a bit dramatic, does it not? It did for me, sons of disobedience. You know, um, disobedience is their nature, their character. Um, sons that are their daddy's children. Um, their father is disobedient. And then he says, among those whom we all once lived, we all lived among the sons of disobedience. 
you know, and I, um, and then he says, then we, I asked the question, how did we live among the sons of disobedience? And he answers that question. Uh, we once lived in the passions of our flesh. Passions is one of those words that we get a little bit mixed up on that one. Because, you know, here it's not good. Isn't that right? It's not good at all. The passions of our flesh. But we need to be passionate, right? I grew up with the King James Version. I did. Passion was always a bad word. It was always a bad word. And the only time it wasn't a bad word was when it talked about suffering. The movie, The Passion of Christ, has nothing to do with his intense desire. It has to do with suffering. We've changed that word around a little bit. We need to understand that we've changed it around a little bit. The passions are, it would be the equivalent of lusts. Okay? Think, you'll probably think twice when you use that word next time, won't you? But um, the passions of our flesh. Now, when we read that, it sounds ominous, doesn't it? It really does. Paul is not talking about the depths of debauchery. I just love that word debauchery. When you say it, it just sounds bad, does it? He's not necessarily talking about what we consider the depths of debauchery. He's talking about that we just lived according to our own desires. We wanted to do it our way. Now, all of us have certain weaknesses, and they're probably different. Mine is I want to do it my way all the time. I want everybody else to do it my way all the time. I blame that a little bit on I'm an American, okay, I'm a Texan, I'm a Baptist, I'm a guy. <laughs> Don't tell me what to do. Am I right? Oh, it's true. And that's what he's talking about. It's the idea of we're not doing it God's way. We're not doing it what he wants done. Simple as that. Whatever that may be, debauchery or not. And then, he, you know, we hear phrases like, what is your dream? And I'm going, really? I mean, really, that's something you hear only in television, right? Only in television. Are you living your dream? Are you living your dream? I don't remember having a dream. My dream is just to get to do it my way. I'm really much concerned about what it is, but that's what he's talking about here. That's what he's talking about when he, when he, he talks about living in the passions of our flesh and then also the carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. That's what we're doing. We're not living the way God wants us to live. That last phrase is even more ominous. And we were by nature children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. We were hanging out with the sons of disobedience, whether we got the leather jacket with it embroidered on the back or not. And we're by nature children of wrath. Now, I'm going to get back to that one because that was kind of a biggie, if you don't mind. Now, I said earlier that we're going to hover over this scripture for a little bit. Uh, that's what we've done so far. And I want to shift gears because one thing I, I said we need to look at, what Paul is pointing out, that he's talking about our pre, excuse me, not pre, that's not the best word, our before Christ life, before we came to know Christ as Lord. I grew up in a, a wonderful church. It really was. As far as I know, it's wonderful. It's the first one I was ever in. When I was born, there was one too many kids to go out into the country to church. We had to start, we started going to church in town. So it's the only church I knew until I graduated from high school. I loved it. And, and in that particular day and time, we heard testimonies a lot, all the time. We were even taught how to do them. And they all went kind of like this. Before I was a Christian, I did this, 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 and this, and some of that. Now I'm a Christian and look at me now. Oh, you know what I mean? It went something like that. Now the problem with, that I was having with that is that my after Christ life wasn't that good and my before Christ life wasn't that bad. At least how I saw it. I came to know Jesus Christ as my Lord when I was 15 years old. Now I know a 15 year old can do a whole lot of sinning. All right? But that's just 15 years. And you really can't blame me for the first two or three. Isn't that right? But, um, but from 15 to 66, that's a lot of years of sinning. Right? And some of them seem a whole lot bigger than the ones that were when I was 15. But this is the way I felt. 
When I'm hearing this, I'm going, wait a minute, I don't think I have everything quite in line right. Paul talks about our lives before Christ, but he takes a different approach than what I remember when I was a young teenager. He points out that everyone's life before Christ is essentially the same. Now you're thinking, no. Yeah. Everybody's life before Christ is basically the same. Boil it down, it's pretty much the same. Now there are two extremes, I would say. I'm gonna mention the two. One of them is a guy I met at a funeral about two months ago. As soon as um, Daniel said, you wanna preach? And you know, I, I responded the same way I responded to my father-in-law when he said, you wanna go to Brazil and preach? I just said, yes, um, because I was required to. At the time, Daniel, I got to admit, I wasn't that excited about it. I was a little bit nervous. Thank you very much. Um, but um, uh, I, I went to a funeral. I had to speak at a funeral of a family member. And there was another man there that was speaking. And I, I met him. We had lunch together. I learned about this guy from other people. I mentioned his name, Adam Luke. It's an easy name to remember. Charlotte pointed this out. He started off as Adam. He ended up as Luke. Um, and it's true. This man's life before Christ was terrible. Not on me. I don't, you don't need the details. Let's just say on the, on the terrible scale, he was at a 9.5. I'm not kidding. I've never heard a terrible story better than his. It was a good one. Not a bad one. How will you look at it? His after Christ story is beautiful. His before picture, he was married to this woman. His after after picture, he's still married to her. His before picture, he had children and, and, and they still love him or they do love him. How will you look at it? It's wonderful. Now that's the one extreme, right? And then there's the rest of us. And that's the way it works. If we all fit somewhere in between our life before and our life after. Um, you see, in this passage that we've looked at, there's no mention of the details of our past. Nothing about lying or stealing or all those sins that we can make a big long list about. And there's two reasons. One is because it just doesn't matter because it's not about us. It's about Jesus. Now that's important to know. It doesn't matter because it's not about us. Jesus was raised from the dead I got this from somebody else and I loved it. And that power started raising the spiritually dead. Isn't that beautiful? Now, if I thought to, to write down where I got it, I would tell you. So let's look a little bit closer at this, at this picture, uh, this picture of our, our before picture. Now, now we're getting closer to the floor plan. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You have to say that verse over and over again because I was reading it wrong for years. And I've quoted it wrong for years. I've always said, and you were dead in your trespasses, but not in the trespasses. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. It's one sentence. Every once in a while, and Daniel's not the only one, Pastors tell us a lot. Sometimes the numbers are just in the wrong place. I think number two is in the wrong place. I can say that because I don't think God, what I'm saying here is it wasn't Paul that put the numbers in there, right? It's one thought. You were dead in the trespasses and sins and sins in which you once walked. He's describing in that first part, our condition and our position. Our condition is that we were dead. Um, this is one of Paul's favorite terms for someone who's not a Christian, dead. Uh, it, and it really fits. It's the best one. I, and when I say it's the best one, it's Paul's favorite. So that's why I say it's the best one. See, dead is the great equalizer. I don't know where I got that phrase, but I love it. Dead is the great equalizer. If you want to see equality, dead, that's where it, if, where we're really, truly equal. B.C., before Christ, we were dead. And we were all dead. And because, you know, when you're dead, you can do nothing about your situation. 
You can do nothing about it. You see, the situation was hopeless. We can't get undead on our own. We can't get undead on our own. You see, we hear so often that there's nothing that we can do for our salvation. There's nothing we can do to add to our salvation. There's nothing we can do to remain saved. Why? Because we were dead and you can't get undead on your own. And everything you did before you're, there is no good before you were dead, you see. And you have to get someone to undead you. Richard's gonna talk about that, by the way. That comes up next, beautifully. Nobody ever, very few sermons are preached on the first two, three verses. It always starts with verse four. Isn't that right? Um, that's where the good stuff comes in. All right. So he's talking about our condition. Our position is where we were walking. Um, we were walking, and it's a figure of speech. I love this phrase, walk. In the newer translations, walk is often translated lived, which is accurate, but not complete. You see, when we walk, it means from this room to the car, right? You know, or from across the compound to another building, from the parking lot to the grocery store. That's what we walk. Or we walk in the park just for fun. Or we do it for exercise. In that day and time, they walked everywhere. And every time they started walking, it was for a purpose. They're going somewhere. Do you ever hear anybody say, I I'm going to go walk to the grocery store. I'll be back later. No, we don't say that. You know, because we don't do purposeful walking anymore. When they walked, it was going somewhere. It wasn't just how they lived, but it's the direction that they're living. That's what walking is talking about. We walk, we live in a direction. Our position is just that. We, are pur we were purposely living a life with no direction, just living it. Now, that's what means dead and walking around. Uh, we were dead, and yet we're walking around. Isn't that right? Small point, but it's really good. If you're going to study Scripture, if we are going to study Scripture, we've got to learn new words. We've got, a new, we've got to learn how these words are being used, old words and how they're being used. You can't talk about things of God with the same old language. Let me explain. Uh, remember I one time I bought Charlotte a, a vacuum cleaner. Gentlemen, y'all might, I, did, I said vacuum cleaner. That's not right. Sewing machine. Some of you guys may have made that same mistake. Um, okay. And uh, she's trying to do this sewing thing. All right. And she gets out the, uh, the pattern and it says to do this. And she says, what is that? And I said, I have no idea. And it's a sentence with words in it that I don't know. So you can't just look it up. Now, you got to understand, too, this is pre-Google. You know, we carry our brain in our pocket, pretty much. No offense, but we do. Okay? If you're going to sew, if you're going to fish, if you're going to work on a car, when you go into AutoZone and you're saying, I need that thing that, you know, is sticking out of the top, okay, and it's connected to this, I'm, this round dealy here. And the guy looks at me like, really? Okay. And that's true. So I, but hey, I have an expert I go to on things like that. The point here is he's using language that elevates our own understanding because we need to. Dead and walking around. That's what he says. Dead and walking around. Condition, position. Now, this is how this works. We were, because we were living in disobedience, we were dead to obedience. When, obedient, when disobedience is where you are, you're dead to obedience. When you were, we were living in rebellion, we were dead to submission. Ooh, these are good words, aren't they? Because we were living in unbelief and rejection, we were dead to faith and trusting. Now, that's what he's talking about here. We were spiritually dead. I was spiritually dead. Without my Savior, without a Savior, I had no spiritual inclinations at all. Now, let me insert something here, small thing, is that you may say, well, wait a minute. I remember God working in my life long before I made that public commitment. True. That's true. 
I can list things where God was working in my life. And I can mention the fact that the two before upside the head was part of it, right? But it all came from him, nothing from me. Does that make sense? If think about it, we go, well, you're right. It was pastors, Sunday school teachers, mom and dad, church, you know, that kind of thing. So you, God was working in your life before you came to know him. But before there was no spiritual inclination coming from you. And that's what we're talking about here. Um, now we need to talk about trespasses and sins too before we get out of here because <laughs> we're still doing those, right? I mean, you, it's like, what, what, wait, 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 wait. It, trespasses and sins. I need some explanation on those because that seems to be carrying on from my BC days, right? Sort of. You see, um, trespasses, let me define them first. Trespass, it's just not that hard to define. It means being where you're not supposed to be. That's really all it means. Being where you're not supposed to be. You cross the line. I can remember uh, uh, my daughter number two. Um, too much like me. I hate to say that. But I told her to go to her. You'd be in your room. You can play if you want to, but don't get out of your room. She said, uh, I said, now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put a piece of tape by the door. That was another one of those things where I, that was wrong for me to do that. I drew a line. Don't cross that tape. Okay? I thought I was so brilliant. I left. All right? Charlotte's watching her, and she's doing this. You see? Can you see yourself in that? That's trespassing. Going where you're not supposed to be. Sins just simply means not living up to who you're supposed to be. I heard that a whole lot. Did you, did you ever try, did you ever hear your parents say you're not living up to your potential? You know, okay. Uh, apparently my mother had a great uh, a vision of my potential because I wasn't ever living up to it. Um, but that's what God is saying to us. You're not living up to what you should be. That's what God's saying. There's, that's what he was telling us that's before. Now there's, they carry on. Now here's the thing, the difference, and we, we need to get it, this into our heads or we're gonna mess up. So it says right here in my notes. I got it underlined. We're going to trespass and sin, but we're no longer dead. Now that's important. It was important to me when it dawned on me. I'm no longer dead. What does that mean? Well, first of all, Ephesians chapter one, verse seven says, we have redemption. We've been redeemed through his blood and forgiveness of our trespasses. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Okay. Um, that's my accent point. Did y'all notice that? All right. We're not dead anymore. We have a choice. We have a choice. Here's the thought I had. I can't remember. If I, yesterday. I'm not kidding. It was yesterday. And I got to thinking, you know, it might be a good idea if we thought more about the sins we chose not to commit. We dwell a lot on the sins we did commit. But the point of the matter is, is you sinned, you know it, you ask God to, for, you, you repent, ask God to forgive you, and it's behind you. It's a simple process, right? Now, we say it's simple, that means, well, it really doesn't, you gotta suffer a little bit, you know, and be in anguish a little bit, or it's not real. I can feel bad about something and not cry, or get an ulcer, or a stomach ache. Sometimes I feel bad about a thing and I get them all. But that's how we deal with sins. But no one's ever said, you know, what if we gave some thought to the sins we didn't commit? Now, I'm not talking about the big list. I'm talking about the ones where you know, right? The temptation was there. You felt it. And you didn't choose to do it. It could be a small thing. Again, with me, most of my temptations come straight through what I say. I can't keep my mouth shut. Everything that's in my head, good or bad, comes right out. Uh, and they're right, Steve. Okay? Um, now, that's just the way it is. And sometimes I want to snap. Daughter number two, she is the queen of sarcasm. I'm not kidding. And she does it with, with artistic flair. Um, I mean, she can, if she had to, slice you to pieces and just walk away as your as pieces are just falling off of you. Okay? I mean, she's just that good. Where she learned that, I have no idea. But the point here is, is there's times I need to keep my mouth shut and I don't. 
I need, but you can feel the temptation. Are we not tempted? You say, yes, we are. And you know what you're tempted to do? Yes, you do. And what if you say, no. And you feel that whoosh feeling, right? No, something else? I just started thinking about it just the other day. I think I'll give that some try. I'll think about those times because right now we have a choice. We're not dead anymore. We have purpose. Now, um, you know, uh, Charlotte listens to uh, Tim Keller a lot. So I'm exposed to a lot of Kellerisms. Um, Tim Keller's just good. You know, I, I discover these guys after they die. Uh, I, that's just the way it is. Um, I didn't know about C.S. Lewis until after he was dead. There's so many things. Uh, one right after the other. I'm going, oh, he's good. Yeah, he's dead too. Um, Tim Keller is just good. Well, he was, quote, he was quoting somebody, and this is what he said. He said, I heard this, this person. He said, I heard this voice in my head saying, how can you say you're a Christian? And then, and then Keller said, he stopped the illustration. He said, this is what all Christians hear. It's true. You've heard it, haven't you? How can you be a Christian? Um, and then he went right on. See, we know that we have Christ in us. We know Christ lives in us because we're not dead. We're not dead. You're either dead or Christ is in you. You see how, how different those are? You wouldn't be doing the things you're doing if Christ was not in you. You'd be doing something completely different. You'd be dead. I didn't say we're all great Christians. I just say we're solid, in, locked in, redeemed, delivered, sealed by the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to kind of wrap this up a little bit because there's a verse there at the end. It says, but we're by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. That's kind of a scary a verse to me, but it points out the fact that I need saving not only because of my sins, but also because I'm a sinner. In other words, that's my nature. You know, um, I can quit doing some sins, but I need someone, I need, I need to be delivered from the power of sin. I have been delivered from the penalty, but I need to, I need to, I need him working in my life so that I can say no to the temptations more often. All right, let me wrap this up. That man I had lunch with, Adam, Luke. Um, you know, we all know somebody like that, don't we? Somebody who, who lived that life ooh, and got saved and now they're going, oh, and they're just doing great, right? You know, they just seem to have an appreciation of the things of God that it's just astounding. Can I get just one or two amens? Okay, a couple of us understand. I know I've got friends like this and I've often wondered that's not fair. They seem to be getting more from their Christianity than I am, right? Okay, this is when it dawned on me. The grass is always greener on the other side, even with grace. I didn't live that life. I didn't go to prison. Okay, I didn't kill anybody. You see what I'm saying? I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up in, in a lovely church. I'm grateful for my life. Grace. Sometimes with grace, it looks greener on the other side. Um, now, uh, there are times when I doubted my salvation because my story wasn't, my testimony just didn't seem to be good enough. It's true. Uh, when I went to Hardin-Simmons, I was studying to be a pastor, minister, whatever, pastor. Um, and uh, I was in all these classes with preacher wannabes. Most of them were older than me, taller, better looking, smarter, carried a briefcase. Um, I thought, there's no way I'm going to make it. My story is not good. You know, I don't, I just don't have, I, my story is just not good. And I would have times in the dorm where I truly doubted my salvation because my story just wasn't that good. Then I realized it's not about the amount of sins I committed it's who's running my life. And that's really what it is. It all boils down to who's the boss. 
authority. Now, I may mess up, but I know when I mess up. I, may, I will sin, but I know that I'm going against the one who's running my life. That I know. I'm not dead anymore. But God comes next, made us alive. Precious God and Father, we so thank you that you showed us that we're all in the same boat, same needs. You are the same for each and every one of us, meeting those needs in the most beautiful fashion. Father, I pray that we will get our past sorted out so that we can appreciate our present and our future better. Father, these things we pray in your son's most precious name. Amen.